guys. So, I figured that now what we would do is talk a little bit about tangs. And we got rat tail tangs. We got full tangs. <coughs> oh, sorry about that. I got a bit of hiccups. And then I guess we have no tangs, which is like folding knives. And uh, when it comes to rat tail tangs, we got like these half tangs that go sort of halfway into the handle. So they don't all the, go all the way through. A through tang will go all the way, all the way through. And then generally it is peened down. And this, the nice thing about that, of course, is you can push your handle material really nice and firm against the shoulder. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about, you know, rat tails being weak full tangs being strong um, it's what you have to remember is like the most important thing is like where are your holes right because on a on a full tang generally what you see often is you can have a super massive blade like this right and then um, let's actually do a quick this is like a pretty familiar shape like a tactical chopper now the problem you have here is that uh, when you're hacking with this the forces are going up here they're translating a lot of the energy is distributed in this region and if you look very closely right this area this distance and this distance combined is not actually as thick as you think it is and often you see very often full tangs break exactly from here and the reason for that is because um, this is actually the hole is in a terrible location. It's in the narrowest place in the entire um, the na the narrowest place in the entire profile of the whole knife. And this can be really, really uh, quite a a bit of a. Um, it, it's it's easy to think that uh, full tangs are actually the strongest because it's so much metal, but. How strong is it when you actually have less material here combined, right? These two combined than the entire distance from here to here. So sometimes a rat tail is actually much stronger than a full tang. So don't get so confused about, you know, oh, this is a rat tail. It sucks. Often you will see <clears throat> an abuse test, for example, from Joe X, uh, you'll see very thin and they're not even they're not even through tangs they're halfway tangs in like a mora knife a basic little mora knife that's only a, you know a few millimeters thick outperform full tang knives and there's a lot of reasons for that and often what you see when it comes to um, let's just often what you see uh, with full, full tangs like this is they'll actually crack from here to there uh, <clears throat> because you have you just have to be super careful where your st your your stress risers are, and I think a lot of people watching this video will know where stress risers are. I've I've been quite fond of the through rat tail design, especially the peening, because you don't have any holes in the tang whatsoever. And if you look at a lot of the top sort of most well known cold steel designs, and a lot of the falcon even, and a lot of the modern knives, what they have is something similar to the rat tail. It's all, almost all the way through. You, it's it's a very thick tang, right, all the way to the ricasso and the shoulder. They have a hole back here. They don't have a hole anywhere else. And then they have a plastic injection molded handle that goes like this, all the way here. And then they have a little a lanyard tang, a lanyard hole here at the back. And th there's a very good reason for this. And this is the same reason why katanas, katanas, are they full tang or are they rat tail? where they're kind of in the middle. In fact, in a, in a way, you could even argue that a, a katana has a full tang because a katana, it's a very small step all the way. And what we see with a lot of the modern, and here is your habaki, and then often you have a hole somewhere here or here. Um, and so what you actually see with katanas, which is super interesting, is what we're doing today with our modern uh, you know these 
blades that are marketed as super tough, which is basically like the SK5 series from Cold Steel, where you have an almost all the way through tang with a little pin right at the back. And, you know, imagine imagine you were to make a rat tail and then you just drill the hole here. You would you would immediately see that as a fault. You would immediately see that like as that's crazy. Why would you want to do that? Um, often, what you can do with rat tails is you peen them. You get that handle really pressed up against that shoulder here, right? And then once that's done, you drill a little hole right there, and then you put your your pin through. Now the thing with pins that you gotta understand. Now when I do rat tails. Uh, mine are kind of different, actually. <clears throat> uh huh. Oh, we're getting rid of the katana there. So what I um what I do with my um rat tails, I could actually maybe draw it um down here. My rat tails go like this, and then there's a shoulder, and then there's oops. Let's do that again. I have a tang, a little shoulder here, like that. This is often what I do with my bowies. Oh, damn, I didn't know you could do that. Okay, so right click is delete. I do this, and then I put a ring right there, and, it, and the ring, and then the wood, the handle that I have goes here. Let's just try our best here to do some good details. And the wood will actually fill up here, right? So the ring, right, if we have, um, if we have, a little diagram here in three dimension, right, and there's the ring, the wood will come all the way through. And the reason I do this ring is because the ring prevents the wood from splitting. And so... And then I peen this down, and it presses up against the front. This is not anything new. This has been done for a very, very long time. But I have found this to be extremely strong. And the nice thing with this type of construction is that the blade, you, you actually save a lot of weight. So one of the downsides, of course, with a full tang is that it is quite heavy. You have a lot of added weight uh, in, in, the, in the right here at the back, which is good either for balance or... Um, yeah, and if a if a full tang is made properly, it is actually um, it it is very very strong. But when you're um, let me just erase that. I don't remember now. Oh, brush maybe. Yeah. So um, um, let's get back to the full tang in a second. So what I do here is I push this forwards, and I, I've been avoiding using pins because what happens on wood, especially, is if you have a pin, uh, these forces that are going up and down from batoning and chopping, what happens is they want, this tang wants to force its way through the wood like a wedge. It's trying to split its way down, and often what you see, especially if you have multiple pins in a row, you will see a crack developing here or a crack developing all the way here, and the ring is the only thing holding the handle in place. And I've showed a lot of examples like this in my videos, um, but the handle is still totally functional, right? So the main thing you really want to avoid really is using raw wood, <laughs> in a sense. Or wood, wood is you know you can if you're going to do a full tang, for example, on a Bowie like this or a chopper like this. I mean, you want to avoid using raw wood because when you have your material like this, it's very easy to see a split here, or what you'll often see is a split come from here. To there and that can come from just batoning because this scale is being torn apart these pins are tearing the material apart this is not necessarily the case with more synthetic materials like micarta right so you you know when you're when you're like really heavy into knives and you're a real knife nerd don't be so um you don't need to be so strict on oh it has to be a full tang right uh, you really don't, because it's not necessarily true that the full tangs are the toughest. It, it's just, it really isn't. And often, really, like the heat treat is, is, is often where a lot of people fuck up, because what they'll do is they'll often heat treat the blade up until here, and then none of this is heat treated. None of the handle is heat treated. They just dip the blade in this deep into the oil quench, and uh, 
then it's it's just you got this huge hunk of steel here that's hardened and then you got this unhardened part part here when you're when you're quenching a blade what you really want to do is quench the whole thing you really do and with a rat tail you go over with a little flame and you get to like a blue color uh, you know try to actually temp blue temper after the actual oven temper try and blue temper all that and then for the peening what I do is I heat it up to red hot and I stick it in some ashes so that it anneals so it's very easy to peen over and um, then you only have this rear section that's actually soft now with raw materials or even antler antler does split um, I, I sometimes like to put a little pin you know right at the back just to just to just as a little added just to take a little bit of the force away from the rear of the pommel right so that there's this the blade isn't stretching itself out of that peen uh, of yeah basically now <clears throat> again so when it comes to um, full tangs right what you what you really want to avoid in your designs and of course, this is not necessarily always the case. Like sometimes, you know, it's, if it's not a heavy duty knife, this is not necessarily something you need to think about, right? Because uh, we're talking about like super heavy duty kind of chopper, maximum strength kind of philosophy here. But when you're drilling those holes in your full tang or you're designing the handle for your full tang, what you want to try and do is avoid putting a hole in the thinnest area of your handle. So try and design your handle so that um, for example if we go back to the eraser right add more material there right do something that's more like do something that's more like <laughs> lol it kind of looks like shit oh, hold on um, let's see maybe we just need to erase some more Try and keep it kind of thick at the front and expand it constantly. Oops. This is actually more difficult than I thought freehanding this. Do something maybe more like that. And avoid sticking your... You want to have a lot of material here. And of course, maybe not have such thick pins. Try and go with smaller pins, right? And then... Yeah, you don't. You want to measure your stuff and make sure you don't put a pin that's way too close to the front. Um, it might help. I don't know if this is actually an improvement, but if you're doing like uh, the front part of the handle here, you might want to put the holes like here and there, like this, right? So, I'm not against full tangs. I mean, a lot of the times it really depends on the steel you use, right? So if you have spring steel. It's amazing how much abuse that the spring steel, you know, 5160 can take. It's un incredible. Um, even when you have a lot of these kind of, you know, these, you know, uh, when you make mistakes with your hole location and stuff like that. And I think the funny thing, especially in America, when you <clears throat> take all this into consideration, it's like, oh, I only want full tang. I don't want rat tail. Rat tail is weak. But then they carry a folding knife. Uh, which doesn't have a tang at all, right? But actually, folding knives are super tough. And because they don't have a tang, sometimes they can actually outperform. It's actually very impressive what some folding knives can handle in terms of abuse. They can't handle necessarily sideways movement if you're, if you're doing like a bend test, because then the scales want to split apart from here, apart from each other. But it's actually quite interesting... Um, how folding, how strong folding knives can actually be. Um, uh, it's it's quite interesting, but um, yeah, when it comes to rat tails, you know, don't necessarily automatically think that that's weak or weaker, because often what makes a tang weak is the location of your holes and your pinholes, and what makes the handle weak, especially if you have wood, is the lo is pins. So you know, um, it's just a kind of an interesting you know thing to bring up and the weakest handle you can possibly probably have well, let's just do that again okay so this time it didn't uh, let's do that again. oh what's going on here oh, well something's going on here yeah so the weakest that you can have when it comes to a handle believe it or not 
it's not a full tang but it's a skeletonized so you have this effect and this is very misleading because it looks like it's a full tang right it looks like it's a full tang but it's actually skeletonized now of course you do this because you want the lightest blade possible right we're not doing this for strength we're doing this because we can manufacture the scales so that they're all the same size on the CNC router. We do this because ease of manufacturing, but we also do this because it's light. But the thing is that I think personally what often the mistake is with um, this type of construction, why it's weak, is like look how little material you have here and there, and that's always where they break. So you got to be careful if you're looking for the toughest, strongest blade definitely avoid skeletonized handles. And the thing is, you can make your skeletonized handle much stronger, significantly stronger, if, let's just do the holes first, just to make it easier here. If you do something like this, right, where you have essentially what are cross beams that you see like in construction and girders and uh, this is going to be a better option because you're see that so let's um let's see if we can paint let's see if we can fill up that uh, like that you see that that is significantly stronger than just a a, a basic uh, skeletonized handle and this is this is this would be a better option than just having these sections emptied out because you don't see like if whether it's in construction or wherever it is if it's a desk or like a heavy duty desk you don't just have you know the two legs like this you always like on a shelf you have strusses you have these components that prevent uh, the whole thing from from bending and shaking it increases an enormous amount of strength they probably don't even have to be that thick these these bars here they probably don't even have to be that thick or that large. They can be. They can probably be quite thin and quite small and still add a substantial amount of, of strength to your design. Now, again, the only reason why you're skeletonizing a full tang is because of weight. You're not. It's not an abuse knife. It's not a knife that you're chucking around. They will actually handle a lot. But if you look at like Joe X videos and stuff like that, what's really interesting is that often. The blades that survive the ultra abuse test that he does are the rat tails because they give, they give in, they bend rather than snap. Now, there's a lot to do with heat treat and stuff like that, too. Um, but you will see that it's not, it's not one is stronger than the other. It really comes down to design. It really comes down to what, what you, um, how you think things through and how you visualize the forces going through a blade, right? So, for example, in this chopper here, you impact here. What's happening? Where are those forces distributed in the metallurgy and a profile of the blade? Where is where is it going to bend from? It's going to, you know, where where is the smallest point of the blade? Where is the thinnest part of the blade, right? Those are the things you want to kind of think about if you're going to create something that's super thick, uh, super, you know, strong and abuse resistant, right? Especially if you want to baton the crap out of it. Now, the thing is, you can baton, an, uh, for example, a skeletonized full tang blade your whole life and never have a problem if you know how to baton in a professional way, in an expert way, where you avoid all the knots and you pick clean wood that's got straight grain, no, in, no knots in there nothing no obstructions and yeah you could you could you could you could very easily baton with an, a knife that has a skeletonized handle or something like that but if if there's knots in there you're kind of in, you know you're stressing that blade um again but for me personally i i don't understand well i'm not soup I, I i like skeletonized scales uh, skeletonized tangs i think it's cool because they're very light and you can put you can put scales on there and scales are often they're very much liked because with scales you can um of course get them all basically automatically done on a cnc you know and then just peen them on and then you're done you don't even need glue 
to keep them on. Um, so, f you know, they, each thing has its own perks, each thing has its weaknesses. The nice thing, for example, with folding knives, why manufacturers really love these, is because you save a lot of material in the water cutting of the profile of the blade. It's very easy to fix in a surface grinder, and when you're, and then you can very easily cut the scales, the, the handles out of the same material or some kind of metal and, and everything is kind of, you're, you're doing the scales, the handle, the blade and the sheath all in one with your plasma cut. So the, the folding knives are really quite amazing from a manufacturing perspective for producing a product like a knife, uh, like a, like a, like a knife product. They're, they're really, they're really, um, it's it's really like from a manufacturing perspective, folding knives are amazing. Um, they're uh, they're very convenient for production because you can automize so much of the process of of making them. And uh, there's a you know so for folding knives also you know they're nice to carry, they're convenient to carry. Personally, I think the biggest mistake, or well, personally what I like in a folding knife is something that's ultra thin, especially the scale, the handle. Right, because if I'm going to carry a folding knife, it's not going to be so much for abuse, right? It's going to be much more for. It's going to be much more about. Um, lol. It's going to be much more about portability, and so I like them really, really thin. Those handles, I like them to be as thin as possible, so they just slip right into a pocket. And often, what we see with hand with folding knives, what I what what I find uncomfortable on a lot of folding knives is that the scales are super thick, the handles are super thick, and they're disproportionate to the blade. So you can have quite a small blade, and have a really large handle, right? So you can you know because you you need to you have your locking mechanism, you know your you you have to hide the whole blade if this is like a, a see through cross section right or something. We have the blade here. This blade has to fit in the handle, and you also got to have a little excess material here. You got to have this excess material here in the handle. So the handle is sort of often, in my opinion, just just disproportionately long and disproportionately wide for the blade given. So, but that's not to say that some folding knives don't have that. There's so many options with folding knives that it really it just comes down to your preferences. Um, but you know, a lot of this, this is, you know, a lot of this, this is why you see me often actually making, uh, this construction because the nice thing with this construction is that I, 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 the thing is I use a lot of wood. I use a lot, a lot of raw material because it all grows out here. I take it out of the forest, these curly birch forests. And to me, this is the best way to do it because I don't think personally, I don't particularly like wood. Uh, on scales because it's not very strong and they split the pins will split the wood you can't you know you got to be careful with batoning it's not going to last forever um, and you know the nice thing with this is if you do have a split or something like that if we ignore that if we don't have any pins whatsoever uh, in the um, oh where's the eraser if we don't have any pins whatsoever in here right and you have a split in the handle or something uh, you can always, especially if you don't use any glue, this is what, uh, I do use a lot of glue, like I do use glue when I'm finalizing these products, but I would like to not to, because it's the same with, you know, I, I like to peen things, I like to mechanically keep, keep things in place, and the nice thing is if you don't put any glue in this, and you know, you get a split in the handle or something, or you got an issue somewhere, you can always kind of shave this off here, pull the handle off, then put a new handle on that's slightly shorter, peen it again. So you, it's very easy to change uh, handles on, on through tanks. And you see this a lot with ancient swords. Swords were, sword, the old swords of the past, the, the, the peak of like sword making, they're super interesting because you have the through tang like this. Let's do a three-dimensional diagram. And the most amazing thing about these guys is that they will, let's get that little eraser there. And what they will do is like an ax. This is all iron, 
and then they will fuse the steel from the front here. So the so the blade, so the ricasso is like mostly iron, and the steel of the blade comes out here, and this is all steel, right? And this is all iron. And the beauty of that is that, um, because those you know these swords were handed down, they would last a very long period of time. They could change. They could first of all they could harden the blade, finish the blade, do everything finished, and then ship those blades with the tanks to whomever is assembling the blade. And they can continue to file these areas and fit everything together. So they can change the scabbard. They they can change the guard. They can change the handles. They can repin. They can redo the handle many many times over because this entire section is actually iron, and the rest of the blade is steel. Super interesting, and uh, you see this done a lot. And what's interesting too is you know a lot of these older products they didn't they they were doing mostly rat tails, and you'll see very 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 thin rat tails often in some quite large blades and they're they've been surviving ever since they've been surviving ever since uh especially on swords you will see a lot of swords have quite thin quite narrow tanks now the thing with a rat tail is really what you want to do to maximize your strength is have them as thick as possible like the spine thickness right that's where you're going to gain your strength from on a on a on a on a on a, on a rat tail. Now the nice thing with a full tang is you can actually have a super thin blade and it's still super strong relatively speaking. Um, right? Because you got just extra material and you, you don't have that thickness uh, in the tang that would actually uh, you know, because that's the thing that th with a full tang the thicker you make it the heavier it gets and it gets heavy pretty quick. With a rat tail you can save a lot of weight be uh, um in the handle and you're not necessarily making it weaker as a rat tail you can actually often make it stronger uh, it just matters really uh, the the main difference between what makes what would make a full tang weaker to a rat tail is the location of that front pin hole that is really the most critical factor in determine determine determining determining how strong your full tang blade is relative to a rat tail tang that is really what it is. And if you, you, you have a good location for your front hole on your full tang, then it's probably going to be stronger than a rat tail. But often, what you're really, what you, what really is the main thing you've got to be looking for, of course, is, oh, it's already painted, right? It's, you know, how thick, right? How thick is this? And how thick is this? minus the pinhole, right? Because often you will see massive blades like this, and that distance here, this distance is combined. So this top one here, plus this bottom one, those two distances combined, so the, the full width of the tang minus the pinhole will often be actually smaller than even a relatively small rat tail at the front in that location, which is the, where the majority of your forces are going to be. So there's a lot of things to consider, of course. And of course, you also got to always consider your stress points. So key thing, of course, being, uh, you know, your stress risers. You don't want to have sharp corners, right? This is a stress riser. This is much stronger, right? You want to have those rounded uh, corners. And what you see on Japanese tsubas, now let's go down here, a tsuba on a katana, when they cut this middle section, right, they're very clever. What they do to make them strong is they often, you see where those sharp corners are? They will have, they will cut out a section like this on the top and the bottom. They fill that up with brass, right? And then they cut those corners in. So those corners are actually, um, carved into a brass fitting right to prevent because this you know a tsuba is going to get a lot of force it's good you know it's gonna it's gonna get impact sorry my headset turns off normally every like 30 minutes on this program it doesn't recognize that it's on so this brass here is actually your your force distributor so the the tuba just the steel alone it's actually often 
something like this, right? The hole. But just, um, yeah, this here is filled with some kind of brass in here too. Sometimes it's only a one side. And that's to prevent, you know, the splitting from these corners to happen outwards. And so you can possibly, it's possible that you could even implement that in, in your blade. But if you do this, and it's, you know, if you do, if it's too big of a hole, you're going to reduce your distance here, which is something you want to avoid completely. But you could, technically speaking, fill this in at a certain size. Uh, you, you know, if it's like a millimeter or two millimeter or something like that, and you got a fat tang, right, you could actually... I'm not sure if this is stronger, but I, it would make sense if it was, and actually fill it up with brass to have a sharp corner there, and uh, uh, to have like a really nice fit. Which is the nice thing with full tangs, you don't necessarily have sharp corners there, which is where your full tang, where your rat tail is going to be uh, privy to to fracture, because if it's not done properly, you got those stress risers at the shoulder, of course. And you don't see that on a full tang blade. The only problem, of course, with the full tang blade is you got this front pinhole that's going to affect the strength of your overall profile. And Joe X on YouTube, he has a lot of interesting videos that I strongly recommend you watch because you will see, and it's very enlightening, what is actually you know how a lot of these blades survive and how they how they what fractures and what doesn't fracture and what survives and what doesn't survive one thing that doesn't survive is wood scales wood scales break very quickly and on full tanks and that's because you got three massive pins going through the center of the grain of the wood so if you imagine right that this is your scale you got all the grain right the this is what it looks like the wood All right, this is your piece of wood. And what happens when it's like this? Well, the wood is going to want to split right down the middle here, actually from the front. So from here, it wants to split right down the middle where all those pinholes are. And that happens all the time. And what's crazy is that you can actually avoid that by having a really well-fitting ring. But that's very difficult to do on a full tang, to have a ring right here at the front of your full tang but that would help a lot and the way you remedy that of course is you use a frame which is one of my favorites right now I'm, I'm, I'm digging the the frame handles a lot because what the frame uh, allows you to do now my frames they actually come with a ring right so the cross section is something like this And let's see if I can just, in my mind, remember how to do this. I'm not sure exactly now. Yeah, it's something like this. And then the rat tail goes like this all the way through. It's something like this, basically. And then we peen that over. And so the beauty of this construction is you can have a full scale. You can have scales, I mean. You can have your holes in your scales. And the wood fit at the front. So the wood fits all the way through here. Right? Let me just... So your wood scales fit right over this. And they go right down here. Oh, yeah, hold on. There's a bit of a, a bit of a silly thing here going on. Hold on, I'm trying to think now. So yeah, the ring thickness is here. Oops. So the ring thickness goes here. All right, so the inside diameter of your ring, let's mark that yellow then. The inside diameter of your ring is like somewhere here. Oh, wow, yellow is not a good choice. Let's just fucking do green. 
So the inside diameter of your ring is somewhere here. And then we go back to black. And then this is the guard. Oh, shit. So the tang goes through here, through here, and there. And what's nice about this is that you don't have any holes in your tang. You can peen it all forwards and it's stuck and it pushes that guard and pushes everything really nice and tight against the ricasso, against the shoulders here. And you can have all these pinholes. And they're not in the center of the wood, they're on the top and bottom, which might actually be better in some cases. But the key thing is you actually can fit a ring now at the front too. So I've been a big fan of frame handles because now you can also do all sorts of file work right on the whole perimeter of your scale and none of those file marks are actually um, a stress riser in the tang itself so you know not only it gives you an incredible amount of strength it gives you an incredible amount of artistic liberty and it gives you an enormous amount of uh, freedom in the materials that you choose to use um, so it's overall the frame through tang i think is is like sort of the best of all worlds now is it the strongest it's it's kind of hard to say it's kind of hard to say because i think also personally that um there might be some interesting mechanics involved in having a guard on your knife that actually makes it a stronger blade um i don't really have any space to draw here let's go back here so when we have a guard and a ring and a through tang handle right now it's peen forwards when those forces are coming up they're going they're pushing into here right so you don't get like fully lateral movement that you would like if you see here it's not it's it's kind of pulling from here right and what this block with the guard does is kind of prevents it's, it prevents the, the blade from trying to pull itself away from the bottom of the handle because you got this nice hard flat surface that the tang is, is peened and the whole handle is pushed up against so I think there might actually be an increase in strength if you do a guard properly like this especially if you have a ring behind it like this so I've been doing guards I've been doing rings I've been doing uh, through tangs that are peened and ever ever every now and then rarely I do I do I do do a little bit of a hole there a little pin just far as far away from the front of the handle as possible that's and not too close to the rear and of course at the back you do have a piece of metal there um, so it's just this is just a bunch of interesting stuff that I've learned over the years um, you know it's just an interesting thing to discuss interesting thing to look into um, you don't really hear a lot of people talk about tangs. You don't really hear a lot of, um, you know, you don't really hear, you know, it's the, the, the entire knife world. It's kind of like, oh, f you know, full tangs are the strongest. Full tangs are the best. And, you know, it's their full tangs can be the strongest. It just you have to be really careful where that front pin, that front pinhole is and where you put it, because you will see a lot of designs out there you will see an enormous amount of designs out there where they have a fat back end of the rat tail like this of a full tang it comes super narrow you know and it comes back down like this and it's an enormous blade like that right whatever this is and then they put their little pinhole right there right i mean it's just going to snap right off from here and of course you know two separate structures right so hmm, that's probably not the best way to explain what i'm about to explain but when you have this right you have you have two separate areas right it's like it's like you know it's not it, you you just have a massive loss in material so you got to be careful with your pins and chances are you're probably better off actually having smaller pins. And again, this is mostly, um, you know, this really depends on what materials you want to choose on your handle, 
how strong you want the blade to be, how light you want it to be. These are all things you got to consider when taking all of this into consideration. So really what this whole thing that I'm talking about today in terms of tang design, in terms of blade design, is how light do you want the blade to be? How strong do you want the blade to be? How big do you want the blade to be? Or where do you want the balance point to be? Because on this kind of design that I like to do, the balance is forward. You reduce a lot of unnecessary weight or quote unquote unnecessary and you can have a lighter blade as well, but your chopping, your your balance point is more forward, so you can actually get some more leverage. Now, the nice thing with a full tang is if you like your balance point to be closer to the hilt, that's also possible to do because now um, you got more mass here at the rear, which is great for a very large, uh, like even swords, you know, or in large blades. Uh, so, you know, where do you want your balance point to be? How strong do you want your blade to be? Um, how light do you want it to be and all these things, you know. So if you wanted to make a really, really strong light knife, right, let's say the scalpel, well, the strongest that you can possibly make the scalpel, right, oh my god, that is not a scalpel. Let me just, so when it comes to the scalpel, right, it's something like this. The scalpel you can find on my website at hotmetalives.com. It's 2 point something millimeters, 2.1 millimeters thick or something. Overall, it's around 14 centimeters. Now, the if you want uh, the lightest, if you want the lightest, smallest, thinnest blade possible, like overall construction, that's as strong as possible. You're not going to have scales on this. You're not going to put pinholes in here, right? Because this point immediately when you put a pinhole here at the front it's gonna break there's very 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 little material in that front pinhole to 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 offer a really really strong blade right because it's so thin because there's so little material in the scalpel uh, using fault using a using a f scales with pins is not advisable because you're going to substantially reduce the strength of the blade but that doesn't mean it's not a full tang, right? That's just a full tang with scales. The trick with the scalpel is you do a katana wrap, right? The same way that, uh, the same way, for example, that Cold Steel does injection molding, right? On their SK5 blades, right? Their injection molded handles with the hole at the back. So you don't have any crazy holes in the tang that could reduce the strength of the blade. And now you have, you just, you, you wrap it. So it's a, it's a full tang, but it's got a katana wrap. So arguably, you could say that the strongest blade in, in, uh, that you could make is a full tang with a wrapped power cord handle. Because the, um, there's no holes in the tang, right? Makes a lot of sense. So... Or you could even take it one step further. The strongest handle you could possibly make is probably your katana with a pinhole at the back, right? Because you got a katana is basically it's a full tang slash rat tail, right? It goes in, but you got this wood that goes over like this and it fits inside a ring. Believe it or not, katanas have rings. So let's put the tsuba in just for the sake of having a tsuba. The katanas have rings at the front of the handles, just like I do with these Bowie knives and other knives. They do this, and then they do their power cord wrap, and uh, sorry, they do their they do their katana wrap right over it. And the wrapping should help actually keep the wood together. But what's interesting is that they don't use metal pins, they use wood pins. And it's possible that the reason they use wood pins is because metal pins help induce cracks in the wood. They will help the wood split and having a wood pin wood pins don't look good i've tried to do wood pins on full scale knives it doesn't look good or at least it's difficult to make it look good but there's a reason why they use wood pins and i think a lot of it has got to do with the fact that there's a wood structure underneath that in the the, the, the katana handle is made of a wooden it's, it's a wood structure and uh there's a ring at the front this is very important that keeps the wood from splitting um but um, they don't have a metal pins. They have 
they have these wooden pins. And they actually, from what I understand, they would carry a small pouch with extra wooden pins in case that that wooden pin broke. So it's a, it's a blade that's completely dismantable. That's the interesting with, thing about the, the, the katanas. Okay, when, you, when you really think about one of the strongest constructions out there, the katana really ranks right up there. The katana is an unbelievably strong design, theoretically speaking. Um, just the nature of how it's forged um, and just the nature of how it's constructed. It's a very, 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 very strong construction. Um, and it's very unlikely to break. In, in, and it's very unlikely to fracture. I mean, that's really what we're avoiding here. That's kind of the big the big thing about all this is avoiding fractures in your blade. Um, but the neat thing with katanas, right, they have this thing where they insert the soft metal in the spine of your of the um, ingot or your billet and they forge that out that's that's actually why you should never do uh san mai on really large blades because san mai bends and stays bent san mai is not very strong actually san mai is not very strong at all homogeneous 5160 is much stronger than any san mai and you'll see that also on joe x when you watch his stuff you'll notice that all the san mai stuff just breaks because it's just fused together it's welded together but what we haven't seen him test, of course, is this traditional katana method of basically having um, a full steel on the outside of your mild steel in the middle. So the mild steel is basically running down the middle inside of the blade. And that would be very, very interesting to, to experiment with on bowies because I think that would be the strongest construction for, you know, any type of uh, hunting knife or whatever because you're... Yeah, you're encompassing your your spring steel in 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 uh, a carbon like a in a high carbon steel, and now you have a much stiffer uh, system rather than a sand mai. So, uh, and then of course just put the the ring and everything on there. So I think I th I think this is a super interesting thing to discuss. You know, of course take it with a grain of salt because this is one of these subjects that's highly sensitive. You know. People are 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 very sensitive to to oh this tang is the best and this is the best knife design and this kind of stuff. But really, there's a reason why that all of these things exist, you know. And you know I've seen uh you know I've seen um, these vessels right this kind of blade, bill hook blades for chopping branches, right? That are like antique you know back in the old days made and they have the thinnest freaking tang they have tangs like this and they've been holding up fine they've been holding up fine and then they have a lathed handle with a ring at the front and these have been holding up just fine for like decades to centuries right so you know take it with a grain of salt all this stuff of course as with everything i guess and uh, yeah, and of course the problem, uh, of course, with doing a full tang, no pinhole, power cord wrapped handle is that if you do it on a Bowie knife, it's actually you can feel that impact in your in your wrist. Like it's it can sometimes it's not as it's not as comfortable, right? And that's the nice thing with these rat tails, like this one here, is that um, all those impact forces going through the blade, they do not translate into your hand. They actually, it's very comfortable for chopping for long periods of time. With some full tangs, you do feel that vibration. You do feel that shock go through into your hand because those those forces are going straight into your hand here through the tang, the top of the tang. So, and you might not, you don't feel that with the, the, the this one, the the frame handles so yeah really some interesting stuff to, to consider um you know what i've found is that the, the lightest the uh, the strongest lightweight tang handle construction is a is a full tang with a power cord because you don't have any unnecessary holes in there um but it's not the best for ultra large blades because you do feel that impact and of course there is the 
key thing with the power cord handles, the power cord wrapped handles, is that you know it's you need to also it's good that you know how to change them. Now it's not necessarily a must do, especially with modern power cord being plastic, but it's an interesting. Um, that's why it works so well in the scalpels because it's a small little blade and it's very affordable and it's very high quality. Um, but if I were to do you know super large bowies like this. Um, it's not always as straightforward to do a, a power cord wrapped handle. And what I've found a good solution to take mitigate those impact forces away is to actually wrap hockey tape around the tang. So that's just something to consider. But um, what I've what I what my philosophy is the bigger a knife is, right? The larger it is and the bigger it is the more unnecessary weight you have to shave off of it, the lighter it has to be. And so what that means is, for example, with this bowie here in the middle, right, what that means is you want to knock off as much unnecessary material as possible. You need to make it as light as possible because the thing is, if, if it's not as light as possible, you ain't going to carry it with you in the forest. You're just going to leave it at home. You ain't going to do shit with it. It's, you're going to have fun with it for a while, and then you're just like, you know, i got better options. So that's why you grind, like, way up here, right? You do a full grind. And some people, they do fullers. Fullers are great for that. But that's the thing. Like, when the bigger a blade is, the more important it is to knock off as much material. And that's when, for example, this construction here is so important and so nice because... You don't, it's very, very strong rat tail design. So you save a lot of weight. You knock off a lot of unnecessary weight. Um, yeah, and you get a guard. I like guards. I think they're nice to have. Um, I don't particularly like having guards, integrated guards in a full tank. So by that I mean, like, for example, if you look at this bowie in the middle, what I don't like personally is when there you have coming out of the steel itself when you have basically like a guard like that I just don't something about it bothers me I don't think it's as strong because you got to remember that this is like an impact zone and you kind of want to avoid yeah just I don't know I just don't like it very much uh, I've done it many times I think it's it's cool but um, I'm not entirely sure if that's the strongest uh, smartest thing to do on, on full tanks but you, you know it's it's again it's when we're talking about steel, human strength is generally not, you know, it takes a lot to break stuff, especially steel. It takes a lot of, a lot to, to, to break steel. So most of these things are really just in the extreme end of, of what we're talking about, like the, the forces applied here. It might be more relevant with your folding knives, how careful you have to be. There is a bit of a threshold where folding knives can be very fragile. Folding knives are super, super, super interesting because they can often be, if you're talking about lateral forces like chopping, batoning, and you're, and you're not turn, talking about like actually bending it, and sometimes even bending is fine, it's amazing how strong they actually are and how often they're stronger than full tanks. I've noticed that there's, there's actually some designs out there, some blade constructions where, um, you know, if you don't have too many unnecessary components in the handle, it's pretty solid, mo you know, homogeneous materials. It's it's unbelievable how strong folding knives can be. Because if you think about it, there's no tang to really break off. Like, it's already broken off, the tang. <laughs> so, and uh, you'll have a pin there, like in the triad lock, and that'll push all the forces into the scale. So it's it's very interesting. Uh, folding knives really like are, are quite interesting. They can often be very, very, very strong. And another thing about handles, right, especially on Bowie knives, right, like this, uh, let's take the one in the middle, the scales become infinitely weaker the sooner you start to muck about with different layers of materials, right? So you want to have a piece of orange here, a piece of orange there, when you start doing this artsy fartsy stuff on your full scale handles, you immediately lose a significant amount of strength uh, in your in your handle construction. You you because now it's all about that glue holding together. So if you know handles that are like this, 
even if it's rat tail and these are layers that are st stacked on top of each other it's not strong the, sh the more homogeneous your handle material is the stronger it's going to be just by default right so if you're you know you're doing scales uh, you know you the, if you if you're talking about the strongest handle construction possible you want to have you know single pieces of micarta right you want your scales to each be single pieces of micarta maybe a liner is fine um, but as soon as you start to stack up layers and stuff like that that's artsy stuff you do that on kitchen knife handles paring knife handles you could do it on skinning knives on knives that you're not gonna like you know that are not like bowie knives right it's the same with this construction here. I mean, you know, and pulkos too. I mean, it's, you know, you look at a traditional modern finished pulko, all it is is just stacked materials on a rat tail. But that's not strong. That's not a strong handle. And you look at all all sorts of antique pulkos and they're full of splits and they're full, the handles look like shit. Like pulkos, you know, are often not super duper high quality blades. Like your generic pulko is not always like super duper high quality. And the scanty grinds, they're these false scandy grinds where you have a scandy grind with a micro bevel but it's kind of half-ass done and it's just you know the cross section is insane but they work they work they work very well so yeah this is a long video but i really wanted to compress everything into this into this one video and just show you guys kind of like an accumulation of all my knowledge uh, over the years and um you know some key things because some of you guys are making knives and some of you guys are interested in making knives and some of you guys are interested in knife design and some of you guys are, are interested in you know making stronger knives and 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 you know i've been doing this for almost 20 years i've made thousands and thousands of knives i've i've spent <laughs> tens of thousands of hours I don't, I don't even know how many hours i've spent you know researching this stuff collecting antique blades looking around talking with you know the older generations meeting all sorts of people you know, knife designers, knife makers, CEOs of large companies, you know, like CRKT and, and, and Cold Steel and stuff like that. Like that, there's, you know, there's many, many years of stuff going into this and uh, it's all kind of just compressed here in a one hour video. You know, you're, you're talking about, you know, thousands of thousands and thousands of hours of trial and error. I've made I've made hundreds of prototypes, you know, um, so it's it's uh, just an interesting interesting thing um you know just just the way it is and uh, a lot of these things especially like with these bigger bowies it's it comes down a lot to your steel choices because some steels are much more brittle than others and that's when that front pinhole really makes a difference right here right on how strong your overall uh blade construction is so um but yeah, guys, this is a super interesting video, and uh, you'll see, you'll you'll notice a lot of this stuff now. After you've seen this, you'll notice it in my designs. You'll kind of notice, okay, yeah, he's kind of thinking about these things all the time, um, you know. And uh, you know, sometimes sometimes making the strongest blade possible, it sacrifices sort of a lot in terms of aesthetics. It sacrifices a lot in terms of uh, comfort and stuff like that so you know sometimes you don't want to make the strongest blade possible because the strongest blade you can possibly make is a full steel chunk of metal that's properly heat treated you know because there's nothing that can really break off of it at the end of the day so uh you know that's not aesthetically necessarily aesthetically pleasing and sometimes you know it's it's you know you want to add some handle scales you want to puncture some holes somewhere so that you can add some fancy features like for example for me the rivet lock pulko right this is the modern interpretation it's got a little rivet there oh and then we got this here. This is our modern rivet lock pulko. I've actually sold quite a few of these already. There's two little pinholes right there. Very small. It's like a millimeter. And then the uh, hole for the power.
the hole for the power cord is there. And then I grind a little bit down from here. Uh, where's the razor? My cat wants me to go to bed. <laughs> Lol, that looks like crap here. Hold on, let's just... This is what the modern one looks like. That shoulder is important so that the power cord sits flush with the entire profile of the blade. And here we go. Pretty rough, but decent drawings. This is kind of like your skeletonizer without the power cord handle on there. Um, actually, this goes down here like that. So there is a hole right there, but it's a very small hole. Um, and I did those bend tests with the river lock pool go along and it wasn't a problem, right? So, you know, it is in a narrow spot, but it hasn't, there's been no fracturing from there. And again, these knives are made from 5160. It's not made from like a brittle, super stainless steel, which could possibly snap. These are not, these are not stock removal knives either. When a knife is forged or when steel is forged, it is generally 20 something. It can be much, much, much stronger. If it's forged properly, it can be 10, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30% tougher. Uh, with the cold forging uh, adds an incredible amount of strength to, to, to the 5160. And the cold forging happens when you anneal, you forge the blade, you anneal the blade, and then you cold forge it when it's cold after annealing. And this does a per this this prepares the surface, makes the surface very nice and smooth, but it also makes the steel much much tougher, at least less prone to fracturing. And so those things combined, you know, they even through the abuse tests, you know, a hole here hasn't been an issue. Um, but I'm sure if we use some kind of nitro V steel or some of these more brittle steels, it would be, especially if they're, 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 um, uh, the stock removal. So yeah. And then we have the power cord wrap, which basically goes here and you know, that's pretty strong. You know, it's pretty close to everything that we've learned here. It's pretty close. Uh, in terms of the strongest possible construction, but the 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 the, the rivet lock system itself, I find just so nice and useful and and comfortable to have on a blade because it just makes the entire st so prof profile streamlined. So, you know, I do. You know, that's what I mean about earlier. You can't just some, sometimes you if you want to add some functionality or you want to add some aesthetics or something like that, you're going to have to drill a hole somewhere, and you just have to be careful. You have to think about it. You've got to chamfer those holes. Now, the old rivet lock pool cores, um, the the previous like prototypes, it was literally just a flat, long piece of steel like this. Well, it's not very good looking. And I would just put a scandy grind like that. Sometimes I would put a little choil. And my choil, so just, just to get this kind of clear, I start my grinds from behind that, not in the middle, not there, right? My choils start from behind that, and I think that's the strongest, but we don't know. Maybe it is. And then I would just have a hole back here, and done. Then uh, it'd be full steel, or sometimes I would just put a power cord wrap like that, right on top. No shoulders, nothing like that, nothing excessive. It was just done, boom, like that, and that worked really well. That was a really nice, clean design, but I wanted to kind of complicate it more because the thing is, it was so simple and so clean and everything that it kind of, it looked like, uh, it looked a little bit like, you know, I was trying to save time, which is not, never the intention. I always wanted to make the highest quality product possible, but sometimes by doing that, uh, it, 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 Sometimes by trying to do the best you can do and you make something that's exactly what you want it to do or want it to be, sometimes it's, you know, so well done, it looks too simple uh, and that uh, it might look like you're trying to cut corners. And I'm not cutting corners. I'm just trying to produce a really high quality, simple product that's super effective and super strong. Um, you know, you can rely on it. And a lot of, you know, it's just um, an interesting 
it was just an interesting that's that and that, that's partially why i extended the the design over to this new one here with the pommel cap and the guard right and that feels much better in the hand it's a, a lot of extra work but it's it's rewarding in the end and the product is much more refined and it's a more comfortable blade in the hand and you know it's still very very a very 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 strong overall construction so yeah there you have it guys it's a pretty long video it's over an hour long um it's all about tangs we're talking about tangs today on knives um i could do another one of another type of you know handle construction uh like this i don't i think i've covered pretty much everything there is to cover i don't think i'm i don't think i've uh skipped over anything or any particular knife design or tang construction here in general actually there is there is the tang that goes halfway in a blade um that actually i should talk about so let's use this example down here right before um we end this video so there is one type of rat tail construction where that a lot of people do and this is you know it's a little bit this often what you see now this is not because they're amateurs but often what you see is that this is something that predominantly amateurs do is that they do sort of a tang that goes in like this and then they put a pinhole right in the middle right and the thing is it's not just it's not it's often what amateurs do right but it doesn't mean that it's what exclusively to amateurs or that it's an amateur thing to do because you look at um you look at um you know parangs and you look at you know massive you know machetes made in 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 asia and they have just like they have just this they have a ring a wood they have a very tiny very fucking tiny little rat tail little tang like this and it's pinned in right in the middle there this is this is really nice it's like a very it's a very clean way to do handles it's very light it's probably the lightest you're gonna have on a on a, on a full blade um the only uh, downside the only weakness of course is when these forces here are being applied when you're chopping this this these forces are trying to rip and tear the wood apart so often what happens is you'll see if you put two pins there this is when you get your splitting not when you have one so if you have one pin you don't necessarily get your splitting but when you have two you do because what happens is uh, this pin wants to go up this pin wants to go down and they they start to sh they start to pull the wood apart from each other and then your split starts here and then it's going to want to go forwards and into there so that's something to consider when you're doing these right uh these like half tangs um some you know the thing is like sometimes the best thing to do is just to glue it in like this and not put any don't put any pins and with the modern epoxy most of the time it's more than strong enough a lot of these parangs a lot of these machetes that are being used every day to cultivate fields and cut sugar cane and stuff like that they literally they're just stuck in with glue nothing else they don't have a pin they don't have a peen nothing else like that they literally just glue it straight in and it's works perfectly fine for them um so but yeah you want to avoid putting a second pin in this kind of construction you want to have one um, but there is a chance that you will see a split occur down the middle there, Be especially if you use brass and metal and stuff like that. But it's not, it's not, you know, it's again, it's, um, also what you'll often find with pins like this is that as the knife ages, the pins, right, they start to pop out from the material. They do this kind of thing. And then you have a sharp corner, uh, they, cause the wood shrinks and uh it's not comfortable it can actually kind of cut into your hand um but uh, yeah it's um all, you often see this on kitchen knives right uh especially like amateur kitchen knives you'll see just like this and a pin in the middle i would avoid that right because you don't need it the glue will do all the work um like the the modern epoxy is ultra super duper strong you'll avoid the wood shrinking being an issue where the pin starts to protrude and then if you ever have a problem where you need to remove the blade or you need to redo the handle that pin isn't going to stop you because the thing is especially if you're using raw woods 
the reason in Japan why they all have the same looking kitchen knife handles because those kitchen knife handles have to be replaced after a while. When they're so heavily used, they they knock them off and stick a new one on. And it's sometimes it's something they do once a year. Sometimes it's sometimes they never do it. Um, but um, you know, with kitchen knives, um, if you're using especially like raw wood, uh, you don't you really don't need a pin there. This is this is you know this is a tried and proven method. This method here. This is a tried and proven method that's that's used all around indigenous areas of the world for, for making machetes and making swords and making very large blades and and it and it holds up perfectly fine, right? Um, so you know it's it's not a not a big deal. One thing that um, and it's just yeah, it, you what you can do is dome the pin or you can peen it down on both sides and that will prevent any sort of with the wood sh uh, shrinking kind of problems one last thing and this is what i've found to be the weakest is when you have threads when this is threaded and knotted on right it's fine for kitchen knives but i would avoid this on your bowie knives because if you're gonna have a threaded pommel on a Bowie knife, it's got to be like the thickest nut and bolt, the thickest threads that you can imagine, the fattest bolt you can imagine. Uh, it's just not very strong, and you don't really want to rely on a weld there either. Now, what you can do, which is actually pretty genius, right, is you can have a thread there and your nut. Uh, you can compress the handle to the front of the ha front of the shoulders here on your blade. And then you drill through and put a pin, and that that's fine. That's super strong, but those threads, they're if they're like three millimeters or four millimeters or five millimeters or six millimeters, and the thing is, that's that's very thin for a thread, but it can be really thick for a knife. So you can, you know, a six millimeter thick spine on a blade is pretty thick, but for a thread, it's tiny as shit. It's not gonna, it's not gonna, it's not going to handle those impacts very well. Um, you got to just be careful with it. I'm sure, you know, when you, uh, yeah, because, well, for example, sword pommels, right? When they have threaded pommels, it's, it's a huge amount of threading. It's, oh my God, this looks like crap. They're, you know, they're threading the whole interior. When you have a tiny little nut like this, it's not going to do a lot of work. And, uh, the the you'll see a lot of custom bowies and a lot of custom knives and they're super expensive and they have this kind of threaded stuff look i've tried this and it breaks within just a few impacts on wood when you're if you're if you're heavily abusing it it's not going to last very long and that's the, the reason is because you you need such a thin small thread and nut it's so small it's so thin like you wouldn't even you wouldn't you wouldn't dare use it to hold a painting up on the wall so if you're going to go with the thread uh the threading system you you're gonna have to carry a wrench with you extra weight but if you're going to do that you need to really figure out how you can make it as thick as possible and as strong as possible uh and uh one way to do that of course is to is to do this where you bring the tang as far back as possible and then just have the end here threaded but again you don't have a lot of material so if, i think personally if you want to you can use the threading you can use the nut to squeeze to squish your blade your handle forwards into the shoulder of your blade here get a really nice snug fit right and then after that put a little pinhole and then drill through and then you know, use glue or whatever, but take down handles, man. I don't know. Threads are not good, man. I every knife I every folding knife, almost every folding knife I have that have some kind of screws or whatever, they're missing screws. You know, and I think a lot of people I've dealt with this. It's just this is a lot to. That's why I peen stuff. And if I'm if I want to get a custom folding knife someday that's super expensive, I'm going to tell the custom maker. I'm going to tell him, look, you're going to peen these. You're not going to screw. There's not going to be any screws in this. It's all going to be peened. It's, it's going to be like actual peening of the material, right? And a peen is like this. 
this is your peen. It's you you move the material around. Oops, a little washer under there. I like to have a little washer under there. You're gonna peen your material over whatever you're pushing down on both sides. So that's impossible for it to break loose. And if you look at a lot of old tools, that's how they're done. That's how it's been done for a long, long time. Before we had screws and folding knives, we had peens. So, yeah, actually, you know, there there is a weakest one of all these constructions, and I think it's actually weaker than a skeletonized full tang, and that's the threaded, these threaded tangs. They are pretty difficult to get right. So if you're going to do, if you want to do a takedown blade, uh, your best bet is going to be on a full tang, right, with screw in where your pin, your, where your, your scales are kept on with screws. You might be able to do it with... Um, frame handle right but again you're gonna need something some kind of pinhole that goes in through the side to keep it in place because those threads are not gonna last forever the screws gonna get loose it's gonna there's things like that will happen um, but um, yeah those old swords I mean they were brilliantly made and a lot of them have threaded pommels and you would just tighten it as you go along and I don't I it doesn't seem to me that they had any issues um, so it's, it's, it's a, that's probably the much, that's probably going to be the most difficult one of all these for you to get right, to be as strong as some of these other, other Tang systems. So there we have it guys. I think that's the video. That's enough for today. This is like the full thorough Tang, Tang booklet of YouTube today. You're, this is everything you need to know about Tangs from hotmetalknives.com and if you want to support my work you can go and get yourself a beautiful custom handmade scalpel from my website at hotmetalknives.com that's www.hotmetalknives.com and I'll see you guys later and thanks for watching bye bye